I want to introduce our first session, our speaker this evening. Uh, guys, Evan Wickham is an incredible, incredible man of God. He and his wife, Sandy, are pastors of a church called Park City Church in San Diego. This church was began about six years ago. They're in their sixth year. I think this Christmas it'll be their sixth anniversary. And they've got literally hundreds and hundreds of people that have have come to know Christ, have, have been involved in the church, and they're reaching out into their community, and they're doing such a wonderful, amazing job. How many of you know California is a hard place? It's a hard place to do church. It's a hard place to do church. And San Diego, man, it's a beautiful town, right? Uh, yeah, there's all kinds of things to do. Uh, and, and, and yet there are so many uh, wonderful churches like Park City, and they're just doing a great job. Evan's story is really interesting. Uh, Evan's kind of got a famous big brother. Uh, is he your older he's, brother? He's little. Little brother. Yeah, yeah. His kid brother is rather famous. His name is Phil Wickham. You may have heard of, uh, of Phil Wickham. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, he's that, that. You're really related, right? It's yeah. Not, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, this family is really, truly remarkable. So, so Evan and Phil and their family are, were raised in Calvary Chapel. They were raised in the Chuck Smith kind of movement. If, who saw the Jesus Revolution movie? All right, so, so in that film, when, when you saw, right, the beginning move of God in the Jesus movement, right, all these hippies getting saved, F Phil and, and Evan's parents were some of those hippies that, that came to Christ. <laughs> and in the movie, you probably saw like little kids running around the tent and everything. That's this guy right here, right? So you, one of those actors was you, basically, right, playing you as a kid. Uh, so, so this is, this is the story of this family of, of Evan, how the Lord has really just the legacy of faith. And now, uh, they're in San Diego. Prior to that, they were in Portland for a number of years at John Mark Comer's church at Bridgetown, uh, getting raised up to plant that church. So Bridgetown sent, uh, this team down to San Diego to plant and to start this new work. So all kinds of great stuff. Uh, it's a great, great Bible teacher. So, so we're going to bring and welcome Evan up. Evan, come Come on up, man. We're excited to have you spot talk to us tonight. So good. Thanks, Pastor Billy. Oh, man. What a joy. Good evening, everyone. I don't know if you noticed, it's raining. It's very, it's very rainy. We don't get that in California as much. We lived in Portland for four years, so we got rain, but now we're in California. We did get Hurricane Hillary, though. So California did not get destroyed, just so you know. We're okay. But... Um, so yeah, Evan, my wife Sandy, and uh, we have, like you said, the joy of leading Park Hill Church, and uh, it's an honor to be with you this weekend. So uh, yeah, on your, on your little brochures for this week, we, I, a couple months ago they asked me, what am I going to speak on? I told them that, what, what's in your brochure. Um, as the months moved on, as, as my wife and I started seeing what was going on in our church, and we're looking at the Bible, and what does the Bible mean, uh, as far as like, how to come to the Bible in humility, what does it mean that we have written words from God that reveal his heart and mind? Uh, as we got closer to this conference, I changed everything, so that's not true anymore. On your brochure, the brochure is lying to you. On my talk, I'm going to do something different, uh, something that's fresh on my heart. And as I was praying in the hotel room, by the way, we got in last night in the Eugene Airport, which is my favorite new airport. <laughs> two steps from the plane to, to the lobby, and then two steps to the bag, and then two steps to a car rental, and they gave us a Tesla. <laughs> and, and, and we ordered like the manager special, like the cheapest one, surprise us car. We ordered the surprise me, and they gave us a Tesla. I love, I love Oregon. <laughs> I really do. It's great. So thank you. Um, but yeah, as I was praying in the hotel this morning and just thinking like, man, God, what's, I know you, we've already changed the sermon. So this, this teaching is going to be different than what's in your brochure. But what's for today? Like, what do you want to say? And, and I just got this huge sense that God wants to personally introduce himself to you as a person who's pursuing you this weekend. Like, God, Bible, these terms can become like almost distanced from our hearts as we consider them with, with acumen and, and, we, and we come at them with intelligence and, and we can forget that underneath all of reality right now is a trinity of persons in relationship, Father, Son, and Spirit, who have chosen from infinite eternity to make himself known to you 
and to make himself known through, not just through text, but through a, through a person named Jesus. And so I just wanted to state that up front, that there is a beautiful, infinite mind who is personal and who's pursuing you right now. And, and with that kind of <laughs> setting us up for this moment, I, I wanna pray. Can we pray together? Heavenly Father, thank you that you are personal and that you are present to us through the breath of your spirit because of the work of your son, Jesus. And now we just wanna say yes to you. And we wanna come to the word, yes, with intelligence. And, and yes, with, with all the tools and reason and, and hermeneutics that we can. And we open our hearts. How would, you, how, how, would you, how would you reintroduce yourself to us as the person who rescued us from sin? The one who desires to be continually remembered every day. That's why we read. That's why we're here. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. So uh, here's what we're doing tonight. Uh, we're going to come to a really important conversation around the Bible. It's really important for followers of Jesus. Uh, how, to, how to approach the Bible, how to faithfully read it in post-Christian America. And this will barely scratch the surface. Tomorrow you get to hear from Scott McKnight, uh, who I can't even believe, I, I've never met him. And so I'm excited to meet him this weekend. Uh, he shaped my thinking for the last decade. And, and then Latika Wright on Sunday, it's gonna be amazing, my goodness. You guys, hopefully you know how lucky you are. It's kind of, kind of amazing. So, so tonight's very much an intro, not just to the conference, but hopefully to the next chapter of your life in your church. If you go here or whatever church you're a part of, I know Pastor Billy and Jeremy and the leadership hope this will be a conversation that you'll have for years together, all about how to humbly come to the Bible and how to think about the Bible as you come to it. And there may be some of you here that are new to this this idea of like following Jesus by reading Bible. There, I, I don't want to assume that we're all veterans in this room. There may be some of you here that are new, and maybe you're very skeptical when it comes to the Bible. In our church in San Diego, there's hundreds and hundreds of college-age students that have the best questions, and they are always wondering, Did, have, I, have I been reading it with a, with a biased, indoctrinated lens I inherited from my parents, how should I really read it? That's like the, the big questions. They're re rethinking their faith, and that's, that can be beautiful. And so uh, maybe some of you are here in that way, and uh, you might be skeptical. You might be, a lot of people I meet are cool with Jesus, but the Bible, it's like, I'm not so sure. Like, I don't know. Jesus, everybody loves him. The Bible, I have some questions. And I get that 100%. And so this weekend, it's gonna be incredible. And, and I want, I know I, I voice what the leadership feels. When I say I hope this weekend is a space where you can bring that dark, deep question that you've always had and not, and not expect some trite answer in response. Um, honest questions are welcome here in the body of Christ, even honest doubt. Because I make a distinction for our people at, in San Diego. Difference between honest doubt and dishonest doubt. Honest doubt is hungry for answers like a stomach is hungry for food. Dishonest doubt is just looking for exits. It's the difference between honest and dishonest. And so as one of my beloved mentors, Dr. Gary Bashir, says, he says, churches need an atmosphere where questions about truthfulness are encouraged and questions of the Bible are taken seriously, believing that Christianity thrives under honest investigation. 100% yes and amen. And so, uh, finally, before we jump into the text, we're gonna be in Matthew 5. Before we jump in, a quick disclaimer. Tonight, I, I might get a little rowdy, okay? I'm gonna ask questions that I may not feel like I answer about the Bible. I'm gonna pose some questions. You'll be like, hey, but what's the answer? And I'm gonna leave it open-ended like that on purpose, and you might feel slightly unsettled by that. And if you feel some tension, like, oh, what do I think he's doing there? I, I wanna say that's good, that's great, even. Uh, there's a, because there's a lot of tension throughout this book. There's a lot of tension through this library of documents from a foreign country. It's not an American book, you know, you, know, you know this. So you step into the Bible, you're stepping into a foreign, ancient time and place. And it's tense as we wrestle through this. So um, as that feels tense, let it make you feel tense and keep reading. That's what I want to feel that impetus tonight. I'm going to keep reading for the rest of my life, 
keep opening my heart through the tension to Jesus. I love what, I know you guys know AJ Swoboda. He's a friend of mine, and, and he's gonna be here this weekend. I love what he says. Hard texts make soft hearts. And as we keep reading through the hardest texts, knowing that there is a person who's coming to us through the text named Yahweh, Father, Son, and Spirit, he makes us soft as we do that. So, um, okay, enough, enough prefatory comments. Our baseline text is one of those key moments where Jesus gives us his take on Scripture. So Jesus tells us how to think about the Bible. Matthew 5, verses 17 through 20, I love this. This is Jesus on Scripture, okay? Here he is. He says, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. So uh, where, to, where to start out of that? I just wanna put this up on the screen just to name it. We have a problem with the Bible. Um, we have a problem. We have this problem. And just to illustrate from our family, Sandy and I have, f- not, we have five kids, okay? At ages 21 down to eight. And I love our two oldest, 21 and 18, we have adult men, sons, in the house. And so I love talking about theology and the deep, the hard questions and dinner table conversations can turn into, you know, three hours into the night type conversations about what God is doing in our time and how he's answering some of our questions. I love teaching our kids how to read the Bible. And with our two youngest, they're like in the Jesus storybook Bible phase, you know, you know, that awesome Bible with the pictures. And I think it's Lloyd Jones's daughter wrote this amazing storybook Bible, tying it all together as one story. And our youngest river, he reads a comic book version of the Bible, which is really cool. He's eight. And, and so Harper, our one daughter, we have one girl, she's 10. And uh, as I'm talking about the Bible with her, we're talking about a Bible story, I forget which one, but I ask her, hey, Harper, like, do you have any questions about that story I just, we just talked about? Uh, and, and then she stares off into space for a couple seconds. And she's like, and she does this circle, this dreamy circle with her hand. And she's like, Dad, you know all this? How do I know it's real? How do I know all of this is real? And I'm like, wow, okay, that's pretty meta. Like, just like, <laughs> I'm like, a great question. What about the Bible story, though? I like, I'll, let's talk about that. Let's talk about existential whatever. But like, what about the story? And she's like, yeah, that's what I mean, Dad. She's like, all the Bible stuff and all church and everything, everything that we're doing, all the Bible stuff, how do we know it wasn't invented by the government, she said. (laughs) I'm like, that's a really good question. I was not expecting that, but I love it. Let's go. So, So we went into it. Harper has a problem with the Bible, okay? She has this problem. She's asking the right questions. As a lot of you may have been and may continue to be. A lot of you are right there with Harper wondering, but how do, I, how do I read the Bible? If you don't know someone who asks this, I mean, if you're not someone like, you know someone that does, how should I be approaching the Bible? Isn't it like really, really old? How much has it changed, really? Let's be honest about the variations in the texts and the thousands and thousands of manuscripts that exist. How certain are we about how much it has or hasn't changed? And as a pastor of a church with a bunch of college-age folks, uh, with the, the, the big, the popular word deconstruction floating around everywhere, I'm seeing over and over, for tons of people, there's this deeper problem, even than how to read the Bible. The deeper problem is, I don't even know if I totally like the Bible. I'm in church, and I don't know if I like it. And, and if I were, if I, were to, I tell them, to my church. Hey, if I were to take you out to coffee and ask you, okay, this is safe. I'm your pastor. This is coffee. Be honest. I know I'm your pastor, but be real. How do you feel about the Bible? And a lot of them at first, maybe you might be like, I love it. God speaks to me through the Bible. He meets me in the text, which is amazing. And my guess is, uh, if a lot of people were to shoot straight with me, 
in that coffee setting. Uh, they might be like, you know, I do like the Bible, uh, but I, I don't always. And I like that you, Pastor Billy and Pastor Evan and Pastor Jeremy, I love that you like the Bible because I get to be part of a church and sit and listen. And I even like the talk about the Bible. But you know, like going to seminary and like really knowing all the way down all of the things, it's not really my thing. Um, because people have a lot of modern questions about the Bible, questions that make us like take issue with it. For starters, have you noticed how bloody this book is? Uh, very bloody. Some people can read the book of Joshua and say, oh man, look what happens when you trust God. He vanquishes your enemies as you walk forward in faith. And that's awesome. And that's true. And some of us might read the book of Joshua and be like, how is this not God approving genocide? And how is it that God could command the death of infants? and women? And how is this holy scripture that governs how I live with my body at my college or at my workplace? Not to mention all the really bad stuff that the people of God do in the Bible, the rape and murder and incest in God's family, not in just the Canaanites, but in Israel, especially in the Old Testament. So people have these questions, modern questions about the Bible. And then we get to the part like, how, how do we even know what it means? Like when you read the verse, one guy says this, and there's an, now there's 40,000 denominations. So how do we, the whole, whole conversation, what does the Bible mean? And I'll explain with a story from our church in San Diego. At our church, we, we encourage men and women, just like Genesis 1 and 2, garden keepers of Eden, and men and women to lead God's family together as spiritual fathers and mothers. And it's been that way from our church's beginning, using gifts and teaching together as men and women in the church. So, so in light of this, uh, in our first few months as a church in 2018, we had this sweet, incredible bunch of uh, friends that were part of our early church times. And, and they were humble and so kind. But they had this question. They're like, why? Why would you have a woman teach? Really, honestly, tell us. Like, well, Evan, help us understand. Why would you have a woman teach? It says in 1 Timothy that a woman should not be allowed to teach. And it actually does say that. Look at the screen. Here's Paul. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. It got really quiet in the room just now. <laughs> uh, and it's 1 Timothy 2, 12. I messed up on that one. But, uh, and that feel, doesn't that feel hard? That feels, that's a hard text. Remember, hard text makes soft hearts. So that's a hard one for a lot of us today. I admit this. But the question, here's the question. What do you take that to mean? That's always the question. Does it mean do not teach on a Sunday during a sermon at 10.30 a.m. On, on weekends? Is that what that means? That's typically what we take it to mean, but it doesn't say that in that text. It says to teach, and there's no qualifier. It just says to teach. So the question is this. Have you ever learned anything or been taught by a woman in the church? And it doesn't say, and it doesn't say that women are only allowed to teach other women. It just says women can't teach, period. But no one takes it to mean that. So what do you take it to mean? And even more importantly, who is it up to to decide what it means? Who, who's, who has the authority here? Or take another example. Paul commands multiple times in his letters to greet one another with a holy smooch, right? And kiss, greet each other with a kiss. And we're like, well, that's not what it means. It means greet each other with a holy side hug. That's what it means. Uh, and I would say, who gave you the authority to change the, a, a, a repeat biblical command in multiple epistles? Like, who gave you the authority? And, and, I'd, and I'd be like, why do you interpret that way? And you'd say, well, it's culturally conditioned. A kiss doesn't mean the same thing anymore, at least not in America. Maybe if you're Italian or something. Um, and, you're, and it's like, okay, well, what about don't murder? You're like, oh, totally, thou shalt not murder. That's obvious for all cultures. I'm like, for sure, but most Christians would say, well, don't murder unless it's killing in self-defense or defending someone and something you love, then it's no longer murder, it's just killing. But then I would say, well, Jesus said, turn the other cheek. And then you'd say something like, well, Jesus said, buy a sword. And then I'd say, well, later on, Jesus said, put away the sword, because that's not how the kingdom of God's supposed to come. And then you might say, okay, but at the end of the Bible, isn't Jesus sitting on a white horse, wearing a robe dipped in blood and carrying a sword? And then... <laughs> And then I would say, well, the blood, if you read, it's his own blood, and the sword, is in his, it's not in his hand, it's part of his mouth, and it's all symbolic. And then you would say, well, why are you allowed to say it's symbolic? And how do you know what the Bible's doing when it's symbolic? 
And how do you know? And how do you know when the passage is cultural? And how do you know when to obey or not to obey? And I would say, this is our problem with the Bible. This is it. And, and it is our problem. We should, part of this weekend is to submit and admit, admit this tonight. We should just do this because the Bible is a hard book to understand a lot of the time, and it does not take a PhD, but it does take skill and humility and intelligence and submit, submittedness to a community to interpret it wisely. Because the Bible's been used for the greatest good and some of the greatest evil our world's ever seen. Mark Twain once wrote an essay about the Bible saying something like, the Bible's like a drugstore, because in the Bible you have both the poison and the cure. And, and it's true. Historically, the Bible has been misused as a poison which has started war, sexism, and in our US context, slavery, genocide of Native Americans, it's the poison that drove a lot of that. But the Bible's also the cure. It's the cure for war, through people obeying Jesus by giving their lives in nonviolence to war-torn countries and the empowering of women and minorities. The Bible was ex the explicit motivation of the abolitionists, okay? So question, uh, if the Bible's so tough, why keep why trying? <laughs> if it's so hard, why keep reading it? Uh, why don't we just move on? Why don't we just keep Jesus? Seems like everybody likes him and there's no questions about Jesus. No matter what religion you are, you like Jesus. So why don't Christians just keep Jesus and his red letters and some encouraging words from Pastor Billy and, and sing some songs, dry bones are rattling, and then, and then be done. And then just, and just, that's all we need. Why not just cap it there? It's so much easier. Why, Bible conference, who does this? And, and who wraps a book in leather? And so like, why? Here's why. Here's why. The reason we do not move on from the Bible the reason we keep reading is because we are followers of Jesus. Jesus was profoundly shaped by the Bible, and so are we. My friends, Jesus was obsessed with his Bible. If there's a title for this talk, it's Jesus and his Bible. It's like, the, it's like if there's an icon, it's like this. Jesus is obsessed with this library of Hebrew scriptures that he grew up with that shaped his self-identity. He read this thing. Christopher Wright has this amazing book, highly recommend, Knowing Jesus Through the Old Testament. And the premise of this book blew my mind because I was not raised with this. If Jesus needed to immerse himself in the Hebrew scriptures, Genesis through Revelation, what he called law and prophets, how much more so do Jesus' followers have the joy and privilege of immersing ourselves in the books that the Holy Spirit breathed out by his Father used to reveal Jesus' messianic identity and mission. Jesus discovered his messianic identity in the Old Testament, so we get to discover Jesus there. Like, this is amazing what we get to see and be a part of. He quoted from it, he taught it, probably memorized it as a little, as a little Jewish boy in rabbi school or whatever, some kind of some thing. Boys memorized this thing, he'd pray it, his entire way of living and seeing the world was shaped by this Old Testament you have. What I like to tell our church is, why is this a Christian book? Why is the Jewish book a Christian book? Because Jesus trusted the Old Testament, and then the New Testament is what he entrusted to us. So Jesus trusted the Hebrew Scriptures, therefore they're ours. We find Jesus in them. And then Jesus entrusted the New Testament documents through his apostles. And the whole thing is one, as the Bible Project says, it's one unified story that leads to Jesus. And, and it's, we can trust this thing. So because we're followers of Jesus, our goal is to have the same, dare I say, obsession. Not idolatrous obsession, but the same drivenness that Jesus had toward this library from God's breath to have the same, that same drive in us. Um, so Jesus loved them. Here's the text again, Matthew 5, 17. Here's Jesus talking about this text. He says, do not think, do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, 
Not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Okay, here we get a window into how Jesus relates to this, this thing, the Bible, and, and how he sees himself there. So three things, notice. Number one, to Jesus, the Bible's a story that reaches its climax in his own life. This is first and foremost what the Bible, whole Bible is. It is a story that reaches its climax in Jesus' own life. And so see those phrases in, in the text, if you have Matthew 5 open in your laps, those phrases, not abolish, but fulfill until everything's accomplished. Listen, Jesus did not read the Bible as an encyclopedia of truth, right? That might be how a lot of modern people think of the Bible. Like you go to the back and you look for uh, Jesus, Jesus' thoughts on heaven and hell and the afterlife. Oh, it's on page 1700 or whatever. And you get this encyclopedia. That's not how the Bible is or works. Jesus didn't view it that way. The Bible's not some scientific textbook we data mine for definitions and answers to our questions. Of course, the Bible is pure truth. It's pure truth for sure. But Jesus first and foremost read this as a library of ancient literature, a story, a long drawn out narrative about God and human history, why everything exists where it's all headed. And in Jesus' mind, this whole thing is this remarkable true story of how it builds up to him. And then number two, to Jesus, the Bible can be trusted, 100%. 100% trustworthy. And, and how, I, how I like to say to the church when we have new members, when we say the Bible's 100% trustworthy, and, 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 I'm like, and then I ask, trustworthy for what? Is it trustworthy to give us the exact chemical makeup of the ozone layer? Of course not. That's not what the writers are intending to communicate. <laughs> Is it trustworthy to give us the age of the earth? And, uh, no. It, Genesis 1 and 2 doesn't say when or how God did it, but it, the purpose of it is who did it and why. It's not when and how, it's who and why. God created for the purpose of revealing himself and creating a family and saving them. So it's trustworthy for that, you guys. And look at verse 18 in Matthew 5. Jesus says, truly, I tell you, believe me, until heaven and earth disappear. In other words, when? Never. <laughs> until heaven and earth disappear. Never will the smallest letter or the least stroke of a pen disappear from the law. That's Jesus' Bible, this, the, the law and the prophets. When? Until everything's accomplished. The idea here, you guys, every scrap of ink will not pass away. Every letter matters. I love what N.T. Wright says about uh, inspiration. What does it mean that the Bible is infallible and inspired by God? It means every single word comes to us exactly the way God intends it to. I love that, that description of inspiration and trustworthiness. And that's Jesus' view. That's like the highest view of the Bible you can have. And, and the Bible's recently come under fire in the last 100 years in America, which is like 10 minutes ago in Bible time. Uh, but when Jesus gets hit, you know the stories of the Bible nerds of Jesus' day, like the cold-hearted Pharisee Bible nerd kind of guys? They would come to Jesus with a question or an accusation. You never see Jesus railing against the Bible in response. He's, his, his problem is always with people's misreading of the Bible. For Jesus, the problem wasn't the Bible. It was the way people misread it or just flat out denied its truth or misinterpreted it, or bring some weird bias to it, or pride. That was his problem. Because for Jesus, the Bible's trustworthy. And then number three, to Jesus, the Bible's authority. Jesus even submitted to the Bible. Think about that. I don't know how that works in the, in the eternities. I don't know how that works in God's space and time. But Jesus submitted to God's words in the Bible. Uh, check out verse 19 in Matthew 5. He, Jesus doesn't mess around. He says, whoever sets aside one of the least of these commands will be called least in the kingdom. That's intense, you guys. Whoever treats the authority of the Bible as, oh, that's not really a big deal, will be least in the kingdom of heaven. That phrase, sets aside, it's this idea of breaking, ignoring, or relaxing. Whoever relaxes obedience to the Bible so, if, so basically what Jesus is saying, if you break the commands of the Bible, like, hey, that's okay, you know, that's totally out of step now. It's 2023, you guys. Come on, get your laws off my body or whatever. 
Or if you ignore, if you ignore the Bible. Like, yeah, I know, it, I mean, it's in there somewhere, but I'll, I don't have time to figure it out. I'm just gonna live this way. Or if you kind of relax it, like, yeah, I know, but, you know, boys will be boys, you know? Then you'll be called least in the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' view, we're to fully come under the authority of scriptures. Um, but if you're thinking, well, so, so if you might be thinking, before you freak out, please know Jesus was no closed-minded fundamentalist. He was no closed-minded fundamentalist. Look what he does next. I'll put it on the screen. Or if you have your Bible, read on in the chapter. Matthew 5, 21, he says, you've heard it said, don't murder. Uh, but I say to you, look, he quotes the Bible and then interprets it. So he reads it and then he interprets. Whoever's angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Next slide, he does it again. You've heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery. He reads and then he interprets. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Again, he does this a bunch, right in a row. You've heard it said people long ago, don't break your oath, but I tell you, don't swear an oath at all. He reads and interprets. And then keep going, just so we get this. You've heard it was said, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, but I tell you, don't resist an evil person. And he interprets. And then finally, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy, which was actually a, that's not in the Old Testament. Jesus right there, most scholars think, is quoting a popular misreading of the Old Testament that was around at the time. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And he says, but I tell you, here's the right interpretation, he says. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So Jesus, is, he's going on like this. Read, interpret, read, interpret. What's going on here? Well, Jesus is dealing head on with all sorts of popular readings and misreadings of the Bible in his first century Jewish world. Stuff on marriage and divorce and sex and even stuff on military violence in that chapter. But here's what we need to see. To Jesus, the Bible is in constant need of honest debate and dialogue and reading and rereading and rethinking from the bottom up in order to humbly submit to the heart of what it means. Humbly submit to the heart of the text. So just to illustrate this further, have you seen that famous bumper sticker? You know, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. You've seen that. Um, honorable, I love the, the like, honor, the passion, and the faith there. But this, in my opinion, uh, would not fly with Jesus. Because ironically, that is an unbiblical philosophy, philosophy about the Bible. When you look at how the people in the Bible view and read the Bible, that's not how they talked about the scriptures. What is that philosophy missing? Uh, it's missing, the Bible says it, we interpret it, then I believe it, that settles it. Even though that's not very catchy for a bumper sticker, I don't know if that would sell. <laughs> Uh, so I don't know that would sell. But, but, but here's, why, here's why that's important to name. Because you can get your NIV, or if, you're, uh, if you remember Nijay Gupta from last year's conference, he's on the New Living Translation, Translation Committee, which he like literally translates the Bible. Crazy. So uh, uh, it, the Bible says it. Uh, I, we, be, we interpret it. I believe it. That settles it. Um, all right, where was I on my notes here? Yeah, anyone who can read English can open up an N, a New Living Translation and, and, you can, and you can read the English words of what it says. It, so what, what it says is never the question. Everyone can read what it says, uh, what words are on the page. The issue isn't what it says, but what it means. It's always, what does the Bible mean? And this is what Jesus is doing all through Matthew 5. And it's really like freshman, freshman hermeneutics in Bible college class. And hermeneutics, how many of you heard that word, <laughs> hermeneutics? It's like this fancy word for the art and science of reading a book well, right? So one of the first things you learn in Bible hermeneutics class is there are three basic layers to reading the Bible. And here's the layers. You have, you have revelation. This is, what does it say? What, what did God put on the page through the human authors? That's reading it. And then step two, interpreting. And that's what does it mean? And you have, to do, you have to do stuff there. It's not simply reading, it's also considering context and considering the culture. And then application, how do I live this out? I wanna obey this personal God who is revealing his heart to me through the text. So all three steps 
each have to happen, and they're each important from one another. And now, a, a comment on this. This is helpful to, in our context. Uh, so, uh, how many of you have heard the terms fundamentalism and progressivism? Like, fundamentalism and progressivism, as it relates to Christianity. So yeah, well, I found this to be a helpful way to think about this. Christian or religious fundamentalism is this phenomenon that happens when someone becomes either unwilling or unable to tell the difference between those first two steps. So what the Bible, the revelation, the interpretation, they're, they're, they're blurred for the fundamentalist. So a fundamentalist reading of the Bible blurs the lines between the text and his or her own reading of it. So it's that leap from, well, God said it straight to, I believe it, that settles it, without, with almost no acknowledgement that there was an interpretation along the way. And, and that interpretation could be wrong. Like, I'm, I'm humbly submitted to the church and to people who have done work that are smarter than me and to the community around me and to the orthodox faith. Uh, so maybe you've experienced this fundamentalism at a family gathering or something when someone says, well, the Bible says X, and I just believe the Bible. Uh, and you're at Thanksgiving or whatever, and it's like, the Bible says this, and I just believe it. And you're like, I, I believe the Bible too, I just don't think it means that. <laughs> like, you're just like, and it's this tension in that moment. And that's, that's, that's fundamentalism. And then on the other hand, there's progressivism, uh, which is actually very similar to fundamentalism. You could even call it progressive fundamentalism. They're both very fundamentalist. They both feel the same at the end of the day. But on the progressive side, it has this sort of fundamentalistic allergy to step two, interpretation. It's almost allergic to finding a set inter interpretation. So instead of blurring step one and two like the fundamentalist, the progressive just dodges step two altogether and says, well, there's so many interpretations out there. How can we be sure of any of them really? And then by minimizing interpretation, the progressive feels off the hook from really getting to step three ever, actually applying and obeying the authority of Jesus in the Bible. And so in short, just to sum everything up that I just said, religious fundamentalism uh, is like, I read the Bible, end of conversation. And progressivism says, I read the Bible, and then the conversation never ends. So, so that's, the dif that's the differences there. So, uh, but when you watch Jesus, he doesn't do either. He doesn't do, I read it, stop talking, just obey. Uh, he, 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 he wants to have a dialogue with his people. And, and, and Jesus, he's not a religious fundamentalist. He clearly demonstrates that it takes honest, intelligent, humble study to read the Bible in the community of the Spirit of God. And Jesus is not a progressive because he lands. <laughs> he lands on an authoritative interpretation of the Bible. And then Jesus himself submits to it and causes all his followers to submit their bodies and their minds the same way. So, so the question, it, it becomes, how do, I, how do we read the Bible like Jesus? I want to always read the Bible like Jesus. And, and listen, here's, here's the truth. Again, you do not need a PhD. You do not need a seminary degree. They're great to have. It's a great experience if you can take the time, no matter how old you are, no matter how young you are. Seminary is an amazing experience. But you don't need it. You don't need to know Greek or Hebrew at all. <laughs> for Jesus, the Bible isn't just something for the pros. It's something, yes, that we need to wrestle with constantly and read and reread and humbly discuss generation after generation. So our relationship with this library, this amazing yeah, written word of God, is one of humility, intelligence, and skill, and an open mind, and an eye to church history, and prayerful submission to the Holy Spirit with us. Why? Because, like I said at the top, as Jesus followers, we have to come at the scriptures the way Jesus does. Because ultimately, the scriptures understood and interpreted rightly through Jesus, they carry the very authority of the triune mind, the triune creator God to you uh, in, in the world. Like, this is a huge deal. So uh, how many of you from, uh, AJ preached on this last year at this conference, the story of Jesus in the wilderness, tempted three times by, the, by Satan. Uh, how many of you know that story? It's familiar to you. So it's fascinating in that story how Jesus thought about the Bible. He's driven by the Spirit into the desert, and the interesting thing about the desert story, this wilderness fasting, Satan tempts Jesus story, 
is that we've met the tempter before in the book. He, he's in the beginning of the Old Testament too, right? He's tempting in the Old Testament too. In the Garden of Eden, page three of the Bible, uh, he's still using the same old trick, right? Like did, he says, did God really say? That's literally Satan all the time. That's always what Satan does. He uses that trick. It, it, it works so well for him uh, that he used it on the Son of God, thinking it would work. But where Adam failed, Jesus wins, right? And, and how did Jesus win? By only quoting scripture. <laughs> By only quoting scripture, saying it is written. Satan's like, but did God really? And he, Jesus, three times, it is written, it is written, it is written, right? And, and so Roseburg Bible Conference, like Jesus wants us to observe Jesus's commitment level to the scriptures and then follow him in that same commitment. Because to Jesus, the Bible is, what are the three things? A story that reaches its climax in himself. It's trustworthy 100% for life and godliness and knowing why God is who he is and how he's chosen to save us. And number, number three, it is, it is authority. It's the authority of God uh, in our lives. It's how God mediates his authority over his church. One of my favorite authors, Andrew Wilson, he's a longtime friend of mine, uh, he puts it so well in this little 60-page book, you gotta get it, called Unbreakable. Uh, he says this, our trust in the Bible stems from our trust in Jesus Christ. I don't trust in Jesus because I trust the Bible. I trust the Bible because I trust in Jesus. I love him. I've decided to follow him. So if he talks and acts as if the Bible's trustworthy, authoritative, good, helpful, and powerful, I will too. Even if some of my questions remain unanswered or my answers remain unpopular. So good. Like if you, you could just take an iPhone picture of that and forget everything else I said because that's, <laughs> that's everything. That's, that's the point of tonight. We trust the scriptures ultimately because we trust in Jesus. So, so how do we think about the Bible? Uh, we, it's this, it's this f f phenomenon that God is allowed to take place in space and time where there is, there is this, there's this collection of books and the authority of Jesus gets exercised to us through this somehow. Through the, and we could talk about that in the Q&A or through the weekend, but through the covenant family of Yahweh that goes back to a mountaintop where ex-slaves came across a parted sea and saw God destroy enemies that were oppressing them for centuries. And they just turn upward. They turn their hearts upward and say, and say who, who are you? And God introduces himself. I am Yahweh, Yahweh, Elohim, compassionate, gracious, bounding in steadfast love. Here's who I am. Here's what I do. I will not leave sin unpunished. I'm holy. I'm just. And, and, and they, they begin to write it down. They write it down, Exodus 17, Exodus 19, Exodus 24, it says, and they began to write down. It's this little verse in Exodus 17. When the Amalekites lose, because remember the story, Moses has his arms up, and whenever Moses' arms fall down, uh, they start losing, and so Moses, he's, he's, he's getting tired. His, his arms are feeling heavy, and so people start propping up his arms, Joshua and Caleb, and, and they win. God wins for them. God wins this uh, against all odds. Ex untrained slaves. They're not trained in any kind of warfare, and they beat um, Canaanites best because God. And so they want to respond. And so God says, Let me help you. Jot it down in a scroll. It's one line. <laughs> jot it down in a scroll. And so they do. What did they jot down? We're rescued by the Creator, by the God over Egypt, over Egypt's gods. All, no, all 10 gods combined couldn't gang up on our God. And he just, he just won again. He just rescued us again when we asked him to. Our hands were outstretched in worship. Our leader, Moses' hands were outstretched, and God kept responding. And so whoever calls upon his name, Psalm 145, 18, whoever calls upon the name of Yahweh, is, God is near to those who call upon him. He's obligated himself to be. This is who he is. And so they start writing this down. And, and, and then God takes them up on a mountain, and he says... If you be my people, if you observe all my, all my commands, if you observe the way that I call you to be 
in the world. I'll be for you, the God you have seen me be. That's all, I'll continue being faithful to you and you'll be my people. And then what do they say on the mountain, Exodus 19? Everything you say we will do, they say. It's that moment. They, they, they're super pumped. Exodus 19, God's like, you do it and I'll be there for you. Will you do it? They're like, we will. It's funny, but when you think about what's happening, a covenant being created, the vows being exchanged. This is a wedding. Israel's marrying her rescuer in this moment, as the Bible is being born. And the, so, so this, this Bible is actually born as a wedding vow slash document, a covenant document that marks the beginning of this covenant relationship. So from that time on, God's people have always been this people who look at the same document ever since its inception in the Torah, in the earliest chapters, in Exodus 17, <laughs> They look at this document and say, we remember who you are, our great husband. And we as your bride, Israel is your wife, the church is your bride. We will be everything you've called us out of the nations to be so that we can go back into the nations and now your bride will become a bride of every nation. So, so we will. And what's the one thing Israel was perfect at doing all through the Old Testament? Failing, right? <laughs> Israel was perfect at failing. So we will, everything you've said we'll do. And, and literally, it takes 500 years for everything they said they would do to be failed. And everything, they failed every command. All the commands were broken by Israel. And then Yahweh himself comes in this Jesus. Yahweh himself enters our side of the covenant and does everything that Yahweh invited the people to do but they couldn't do so that Anyone who's found now in this Christ, anyone who's in this Christ through faith and baptism is now part of the, part of the faithful covenant partners by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then that's why in, in, that, in Exodus 24, when the covenant was first created, the first documents, the first documents were created, the scrolls, the Bibles, the first writings. It also says that he took blood. Moses took blood and sprayed it on all the people from the rams. And, and he said, this is the blood of the covenant, he says. And, and now, whatever you do, make sure it's forgot. And the whole vow thing. And then Jesus, the night before he was crucified, he, he quotes that same scene from the moment the Bible was born. On the mountain outside, uh, you know, outside of Egypt in Sinai, Jesus says, he holds up the cup, and he's like, this is the blood of the covenant He's quoting this book they all knew. They're like, and you, all these Jewish boys around the table, just immediately all the lights on their dashboard go on. Jesus just quoted the moment that the covenant documents began. He's like, I'm now fulfilling them and I'm giving you forgiveness and power to fulfill them with me, to like be faithful with me. Forgiveness for, because you're gonna be like Israel, you're gonna fail. Every week, I don't know how often you guys do communion in your churches. At our church, we do it every week. So every week, we're confessing. Last week, there were times of failure. <laughs> Next week, there will be more failure. And this is the provision. This is my blood of the covenant for the forgiveness of your sins. And the cup of the new covenant has the spirit of God so that we can con continue to be less and less faithless and unfaithful and more and more like Jesus. You guys, this, and, and so all of that to say, as we live humbly submitted to what this book means, with all, like no matter how much it grates against your soul, like you're, no, much, no matter how much you're like, I don't know if I agree. I remember this woman who got baptized two years ago in our church named Laura, and she has given me permission to share this story. After four coffees with me and Sandy and her boyfriend, Laura, her boyfriend, me and Sandy, she's like, she, she, she goes, okay, finally, I was an atheist, and now I think you've removed enough hindrances for me to be able to deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ with any intellectual honesty. <laughs> so I don't see any other explanation other than Christ rose from the dead, which kind of makes me a Christian, right? And I'm like, yeah, that's definitely, yeah, yeah. Like, like when you submit to that, however, there is, there is baptism because what baptism means is that you're willing 
to follow this Jesus, every time he confronts you, you submit to him, like a life of submittedness. And so her baptism comes, I'm like, you ready? And then she's like, I'm terrified. And, and I said, what's up? And she's like, I am a person of very strong convictions. And I know there will be times when some of my strongly held convictions will disagree with Jesus's, and I will then need to submit. But I have no other way, because with him are only the words of life. I'm like, that's the best testimony ever. <laughs> like, that, that's conversion. When you're, so, so you want to submit. She's like, I'm submitting to Jesus. And I'm terrified. Like you, and then she said, I, it's like I'm losing my life. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I'm like, you know, that's what Jesus said is happening when you get saved. <laughs> so you're losing your life. And so this is what it means to come under, come under the authority of Jesus. It's not just the authority of the Bible. It's the authority of Jesus mediated through this covenant document of this people that have always said yes to this rescuer. Even when you find out that some things this rescuer wants for you go against your surface level desires. You covenant him, just like with Sandy. Like when I got married to Sandy, uh, <laughs> I did so without a gun to my head. I was very willing, she's amazing. I did not need to be coerced. And I even knew that this covenant we would make would change everything about how I play video games <laughs> and how I eat pizza. How much pizza I eat, what I do with my body, what I do with my time, what I do with my money, who I spend time with, who I go out on the weekends with or don't anymore go out on the weekends with. You know, all of those things are, and listen, I stepped into that covenant willingly, willingly, and I joyfully continue saying yes to that covenant. And, and, uh, and it's still changing me. And so this is, this is how I believe Jesus lived. He, didn't, he lived in submission in the covenant with, related to his father. He, no one was closer to the father than Jesus. He and the fa his father are one because whatever his father says, I will do. And so that's what he invites us into. And so that's, I, I, I had a little more, but we can tease some stuff out during Q&A. I think that's where I'm gonna land. Um, so the Bible is this story that reaches its fulfillment in Jesus, and it can be trusted. And it's a, it, not only is it an authority, but it's so good. Like, it's the best. The best news for you is the authority of Jesus. Um, at our church, we often pray, help us, and I'll pray this right now. I'm gonna pray this prayer that we pray at home. Heavenly Father, help us see Jesus rightly because we confess that Jesus as he is is better than we could ever wish him to be. Lord, help us to repent of, of thinking of Jesus as we wish, as we wish him to be. Because Jesus, as you are, is infinitely better than we can ever fashion or imagine in our minds. So help us to see you rightly as we return to this, this the written word of God. Thank you for giving us your heart in written form so that we can know your heart in the living word by the power of the spirit. In your name we pray, amen. 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 All right, uh, that's it. That's all I got. Yeah. Evan, thank you so much. You're yeah. not done yet, though. Because, yeah, let's go. Uh, what we do at these uh, Bible conference sessions, as you may know, if you've been here before, is we have some time for questions. Uh, so Evan uh, will field your questions. And uh, so I just, just one little item of coaching. If you get the microphone, Make sure you actually ask a question. That's good. That's good. And you know who I'm talking about. All right. Uh, so Jeff is going to be uh, 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 roaming the room, so throw up your hand. And I think we've got a question back here. And so, Evan, if you need me, I'll be over here. That's so good. Thanks, Pastor Billy. Are you a part of the Bible Project? No, no, but Tim's a dear friend, and they've influenced me a ton. Yeah. So that's not your voice? No. No, it's not. No, Tim, Tim Mackey is the voice. Um, 
I get to see him next month, which is fun. I haven't seen him forever. But yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to ask you to explain uh, verse uh, Matthew 5. 18, mm. that it says, I tell you the truth until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the last, the least stroke of pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Yes. So then on Second Peter 3, 10, it says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Mm. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Yeah. Can you compare those two verses? Yeah. So, like, I was, I'm not a PhD. You're gonna, I'd love to hear Scott McKnight's answer to that question with all the language stuff that's going on in the Greek. But as far as I know, and I don't know very much, uh, until heaven and earth pass away is a Hebrew kind of idiom for never. Uh, it's just like, until everything is vaporized, it's just as long as time and space exist, as far as we're concerned, this scripture will stand, is the point that Jesus is making. I don't think he, I, pers- I could be wrong, uh, but I, I don't think he's making a reference to a specific time in future history where uh, you know the eschaton is gonna take place and uh, time and space will no longer exist. I, th- if, I think that might be something Peter's talking about, but I don't know that Jesus is necessarily intending us to connect what he's saying to what Peter's saying. He's making a statement about uh, the reliability and e- the trustworthiness of Scripture and how God's authority stands through Scripture for forever, like nothing's gonna stop this thing from having authority over the church. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know that he's, he has like the eschatological consummation of all things in mind at that moment, like Peter does. That's my opinion, I could be wrong. You guys probably have a great pushback to that, and I'd love to hear it, but anyways, yeah. I didn't know I'd just be standing here for Q&A, this is cool. So. <laughs> I um, I love Jesus, but I um, I carry this this kind of this unexplainable problem about the Bible. Yeah, you mentioned it at first, Joshua. Yeah, Jesus says, "Love your enemies." Yeah, God destroyed a lot of enemies. Can you help me with that? Oh, man. I mean, it's it's <laughs> you know when I read things like. These cities are devoted to destruction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Joshua, God tells Joshua, be strong and courageous. And that's great. We love those. We, you know, people put those on their, on on their, they they love those verses. They memorize them. But it's that part where so many enemies were destroyed, totally destroyed. Yeah. And then I've read a lot of, I've read some books on it to try to find an answer. Yeah. And it's like the books are trying to, Protect God. Like explain it away or something. They can't, and the, and the, and the explanations are, are very inadequate. Yeah. And for me, God allowing that to be written and exposed means that he's not afraid to talk about it. Come on. I great. just don't understand it. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, the question I'm hearing is like, help me just process that, which could be a wonderful, I, I, I want to, do a coffee with yours, like a 16 minute coffee, just sit down and, but, but it, like the quick standing from the podium in front of a crowd answer would be uh, the fact that there is incredibly difficult, I, I, just, I just heard this on an amazing apologetics podcast. Uh, again, it was, it was AJ, AJ and Nijay's podcast, The Slow Theology, they just talked about this in one of their last episodes. And AJ, he said, um, the presence of extremely difficult and violent Old Testament texts that seem to be divinely sanctioned horrors sh- sh- should not um, keep us from... The fact that we feel bad about that and we feel negatively about that can just be stated. And that should not keep us from continuing to, to read and to and say, God, why? 
You know, it's that keep reading that I said at the beginning of the talk. Like, there will be tensions that will feel un- irreconcilable. And, and the point is to keep reading. And, and, that's, and that is specifically when that quote that I mentioned earlier came up where he said, hard texts make soft hearts. And, uh, and yes, there are, I think, valid, it's not explaining away, but valid explanations of what's going on. For example, in a lot of those old tests, in a lot of the Joshua like, they drove them out. They devoted the city to destruction. They drove them out of the city. The next chapters, uh, you'll see, and then they were still there in the city. Uh, and, and so there's, cl- so at the end of Joshua, in the beginning of Judges, the end of Joshua, they drove them out of Canaan, the beginning of Judges, and the Canaanites were still hanging out. So clearly there's something literarily happening that, um, that we have questions about. Uh, but so, so there's something literary happening where God, God, command, God is commanding his people to, to drive out. And, and the goal is a driving out and not an utter destruction, some would say. But there, yeah, there's different explanations. The point, I think, for my heart is to remember that the, a difficult passage, especially in the Old Testament, and I, yeah, you know, I think of the angel of the Lord, the destroyer sent by Yahweh to eliminate the firstborn of Egypt. I'm like, Jesus, is that you? I'm like, what's going on? Um, but these difficult texts make me, make me sometimes weep when I think of people that have lost their firstborn. Uh, they actually make me grieve when I think of those who've gone through miscarriages, and they make me more, recept- more listening, more wanting to be present in people's pain. So there's beautiful things in the even confusion about texts that I think so- hard texts make soft hearts. For me, that helps. And I know there's really great, there's giant books written on that one question, which sounds like you've read, um, and some of them are more, some of them are actually do feel to me like they're explaining away what's actually going on in the text, and other ones just say, this is hard, but here's the best explanation I know of in good faith. So, man, that's really good. And Jesus does say love you. I do think there's a, there's a transfer that happens. There's con- the scholars talk, talk about continuity, discontinuity between Old and New Testaments, and uh, and I think this is a point of discontinuity where the way God dealt and the way God affirmed some acts of violent conquest, apparently, in the Old Testament, uh, change in the New Testament. And anyone who now persecutes you is to, receive div- is to receive verbal blessing, is to receive what Paul calls in Romans 12, coals of fire on their heads, a blessed hearth on their heads. Uh, so your enemy wounds you, you give them the necessary apparatus to warm their houses. So, uh, so there, is, there is a radical uh, call. I think one of the most radical teachings of Jesus is to love your enemy. And the question then comes up, how do you love your enemy when they're dead? And I think that's how radical Jesus' call was. Like Jesus calls us to love our enemies. Uh, and, and there is a transition there in how God has his people act. So anyways, that's, that's a deep one. That's a big one. Yes. Uh, you were talking about honest doubters versus dishonest doubters. Right. So when you're in the conversation with someone in the Holy Spirit or you've discerned they're one or the other, how does that shape mm. your conversation with them? What becomes, yeah, your strategy goal? Like, can you help yeah. us with that? Like when we're with a family yeah. member or a friend or something like that? Yeah, for, for, that's a great question. For me, honest, like, uh, the, like I said, the best metaphor is as hunger is designed to lead you to substance, food, uh, honest doubt, is, it's, it's designed, I think it's divinely designed as curiosity to lead us to reality, to lead us to truth. And if I get the sense that maybe someone asks for answers and then, and then they keep asking, keep asking, keep asking, and it goes on and on and they maybe just want to fight, uh, or, or what, then I'm just, oh, that's not what they're here for. And I can just switch to listening and loving and, um, and, and, and just being present to them. You know, I, I have plenty of friends like that that I just listen, I'm curious. Like, what makes you, oh, that's interesting, what led you to think that way? And it's just more listening and questions rather than answers because that's not what they're looking for. So, um, so yeah. Yes. What was that? That's hard. Yeah. Yeah, listening, curious questions. It's hard. It's harder than telling them what you know. <laughs> for me, for me, it is. Evan, thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, 
If you don't know, Evan's actually an incredible musical artist as well and a worship pastor. And I was just wondering um, your thoughts on the direction of worship now mm -hmm. in church. Um, there's a lot of beauty and truth in hymnals. And the same can be said probably for modern or contemporary worship. And it feels like there's a lot of variety now. Some of it seems like it's directly from scripture. Um, and, and scripture also is poetry. And then there's also seems like there's worship that's poetry or new revelation, those types of things. I just wondering your thoughts on the direction of worship musically in, in the church and how you feel about that. Yeah. By the way, you guys, I love worship team. You guys are amazing. I loved you guys tonight. I was amazing being led by you guys. You guys get that every week here? That was cool. Good job, Jay, wherever you are, Jay. Uh, there he is, yeah, cool. Um, we get to rock tomorrow, right, Jay? We, I, he, I think he, he, he's letting me play keys with him tomorrow. That's, yes, that's great. So, um, yeah, for, you know, worship, you know, there's different spheres there. I could talk about, the, you know, the industry or Nashville, and then I could talk about what's going on in local churches that I've personally seen. And um, there's, yeah, I mean, there's... So many, it's so many wonderful, wonderful human beings behind desks in Nashville just wanting to resource the church. Uh, just wanting to, you know, uh, empower worship leaders who seem to have momentum to have more momentum, that seem to be, have God's hand in their life to, to, to be more visible and more heard. And obviously that lands into industry and marketing and all of that. And there's tons of money, tons and tons of money in the worship industry, which is... I'm not afraid of money. I think that's something God uses powerfully to like get, get the message out and equip churches. Most of the songs, if not all that you heard tonight, uh, were resourced to you by multi, multi-million dollar machines that make sure that you have access to the songs that are being sung uh, elsewhere, you know? So mixed with all of that, obviously, you know, humans are imperfect and the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And there can be, you know, and I always thought it was funny that there's, awards, like awards, awards shaped and named after the Holy Spirit, Dove Awards or whatever, that are given for, for a special accomplishment in resourcing the church for that. Uh, but at the same time, it's like, like my brother says, Phil, who just swept the doves last year. He just, he just swept them. He won like the best, the, like the top three Dove Awards or whatever. And, and he's like, and I'm like, and he just told me, all it means to, to me, and I have to keep giving this to Jesus, like these are physical signs of people resonating with what God has called me to do. And I, I can't entertain my ego more than that. Like I just have to acknowledge what it is. And so um, there's physical signs that it's resonating with people a lot. End. Like, let's not, he's like, I don't want to dwell on it. I don't want to make it like mine, like make sure I get four doves next year or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think, I do think sometimes our, that the worship songs we sing, if we want to just talk about the content of the songs, can, can feel exclusive, exclusive. Like, I think, I love the song, I do it all the time, but I don't know if you guys do this song, and I hope I don't make it now a blackballed song for your <laughs> church, but... Uh, that, that Brandon Lake song, who I love personally, he's become a friend. But that song, uh, you know, as the spirit was moving over the water, spirit come move, come rest on us. You know, rest, come spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. You know that one? Some people, that's not true for them. <laughs> like, what do you mean my heart's pounding? I'm just at church. I feel fine. I don't feel, <laughs> like, and now I'm having to sing some, something that's not happened to me. I don't know. I, I still sing it just because I think, you know, rhetorically it makes the right decisions, but it's poetic, you know. So, so there's a lot of different ways I could have taken that question, uh, and that's where I took it on the fly. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's helpful. I have a non-worship question. All right, Jay. I mean, I have many musical worship questions, but this one is not one of them. Is the narrative of the Old Testament as authoritative today after Jesus as it was for the Jewish people before Jesus? Great question. I did not, um, so 
that was a question I was going to pose at the end of my notes, just, just to like whet your appetite for more curiosity as we go. And I wasn't even going to answer. I was just going to put it there and then let you wonder and discuss. Uh, but so Moses' code, the 613 laws of the Old Testament, are they still authoritative today in the same way as they were authoritative for the nation of Israel on, uh, before Christ? And I think Galatians chapter three makes a resounding no to that statement. Moses' 613 laws do not carry God's authority to us in the same way as they did for the people living under theocratic Yahweh, Israel, Old Covenant. And the reason is because Paul specifically says to Galatia that um, Moses or the law was added after 400 years until the time that the seed, Christ, would receive, he would be the one, it was, it, was, it was written so that the seed himself could fulfill it, and then it would be expired. And so the way that Moses' law worked for Israel under the old, so that, this is why you probably had lobster this year and didn't feel bad about it, <laughs> uh, or have a tattoo, or whatever. Uh, there's still deep wisdom, and the New Testament will, here's the beautiful thing about the New Testament, it will pull into itself the Old Testament for you. And, and, and it, will, it will bring in all of the heart of the Old Testament laws in the way Jesus and his authoritative deputies, the apostles, intend you to receive those laws as authoritative. That's, that's amazing. One of the reasons why the New Testament is the New Testament is because the early church was wrestling through, how do we call Gentiles, non-Jews, most of you, raise your hand if you're like, if you were once Orthodox Jew? No one. Okay. You might have Jewish ethnic lineage, which is part, part way there, but uh, for, for the rest, for all of us, it seems, how do we take the Jewish Bible as our book? How? The Christians were actively wrestling through that question in the first generation. And, and so they, they landed on this Jerusalem council, Acts 15. They're like, what do we tell the Gentiles? What do we tell you Rosebergians like, who want to follow Jesus? Well, avoid sexual morality and don't worship idols in the form of all the ways that they did with food offered to bloods and strangling blood rituals. Whatever idol worship is in Roseburg, don't do that because God is the one true God revealed in Christ. Okay, you got it. I'll take his covenant documents. So that's, that's kind of how, how that works. I do think there is a change of how God's authority gets mediated to us from old covenant to new covenant. But it's still authoritative. It's just authoritative differently. I know that can be controversial, and that's where you get into like covenant theology versus dispensationalism. Um, so... Yes. First Timothy 2.12. Yes. I do not permit a woman to teach. Could yes. you share your interpretation of that? It would take a while. That is a notoriously not difficult to read, but exegetically difficult text that would take uh, probably a 45-minute, like, honoring the text, unpacking. Um, but the long story short is that um, you have to take that text in context of the whole New Testament and Old Testament together. And you have other, you have Luke writing in Acts that uh, uh, Priscilla and Aquila taught, Priscilla taught a man. Uh, so so you, have, you, have, you have her teaching in the church. Uh, and uh, and he, she, it wasn't just teaching any man. It's teaching like Apollos, uh, who then went on to expound accurate doctrine after Priscilla corrected it. So, um, so, so you just have to, you have to think, okay, was that wrong? Would, that be a, would, that, would Priscilla have been against Paul? Actually, Paul partnered with them in tent making in the cities and traveled with them for a while, so she wasn't acting outside of Paul's purview. So what is, what is happening? There's something else happening here that honors all the texts. And so that's how I would answer that. And I, to, just to answer part of that question, I think, I think what is happening in Timothy is relevant to Timothy's context. Every, John Walton says this killer line, if you haven't heard it, so good from the Lost World series of books he does, Lost World of Genesis 1, John Walton. He says, we have to really process this fact 
that the Bible was not written to us, but it was absolutely written for us. It was first not written to us, and then it was absolutely written for us, not to us, but for us. And that's so huge. You're like, oh, this, that's why I, I, I listened to the Q&A from last year today in the hotel room with AJ and uh, the other folks in the, in the, on the couch here. And, um, and, and, and it, was, it was so good. He was just saying, we can't just read one. The, the worst thing you could do is read a verse. <laughs> and by that, he meant without the rest of the verses. Uh, yeah. So I like for, but I'm a huge fan of Lectio Divina where you take one verse and you just soak in it for 20 minutes or 10 minutes. But that's never primary <laughs> to understanding what's going in the text. But it is, now that I know what God's doing in the whole text, I'm gonna focus on this one word, go, from Matthew 28 or whatever. So forest and trees, forest and trees. Anyways. So you've been in San Diego for six years now, right? I was born there, and then, um, and then from 2013, 2017, was in Portland, and then came back for six, yeah. Okay, so do you have any um, testimony of God moving any young people in San Diego? Oh, my gosh. I know, there's probably so multiple, many, but just like a so good one many. for us to hear. Yeah, gosh. So, I mean, so, yeah. Like Pastor Billy said, I, I grew up in the like, Calvary Chapel. Like Chuck Smith was my dad's boss for 12 years. So I grew up like, right in Chuck Smith's office, in his green room, I say. And, and just seeing people come to faith there was dramatic. Like the tail end of the Jesus movement was like druggies and ex-prostitutes and ex-gangbangers and everyone coming off the streets of Santa Ana was just coming to faith in so many. And what we've seen in our church post-2018, even 2020 and now, is a different kind of revival. And that is a lot of cradle Catholics, and I think that's great. I think Roman Catholic Church is part of the body of Christ, 100%. And, uh, and, and yet, the, the, the way that they've catechized some of the kids that we've come in contact with, hundreds and hundreds of kids that grew up Catholic, didn't know why they were. Um, and just specifically in our context, we've just seen an overabundance of folks come to faith, come, come to the scriptures through our church and, and, and through the teachings go, oh my gosh, I now understand that this is one unified story leading to Jesus and I, I, was, I, I wanna be baptized. So it's, it's more of like a conversion from uh, like a spiritual kind of inoculation. People are coming unnumbed to the reality of Jesus in our church from previous churches that maybe they deconstructed from. So a lot of that, a lot of that, uh, where people, a lot of people giving church one last shot, a lot of pastors, pastors who just burnt out ended up, ended up just members of our church. And there's like, oh my gosh, I'm in love with my wife and the Bible and Jesus again. And I'm just loving being here. And, and coming into a peace, like the peace of, of knowing Christ and knowing that they're loved by Jesus again after a lot of shipwrecks. We've seen a lot of people um, come from shipwreck to healing in our church. That's kind of been our mission field, I guess. Hopefully that made sense. I sometimes wonder if I'm making sense. I don't know. It's very on the spot. <laughs> Literally on the spot right now. Yes. So a follow-up to that question. Yes. On a larger scale yes. than just San Diego, what are you seeing with young people and coming to Christ? Mm. I, I honestly, I don't have the best bird's eye view on that. I'm very much a local church guy, and I don't claim to have like this eye on the whole, the whole pie. Um, but um, I, I have, uh, there's this conference I go to uh, every year, and I'll be there again next, April, next March, April, called the Exiles in Babylon Conference in, in Idaho. And it's put on by, I don't know if you know Dr. Preston Sprinkle, but he's just a faithful Bible guy who has this podcast. He's a dear friend of mine, and the podcast is just growing like crazy, where he just opens the door for extended questions to exist and, and ruthless commitment to the authority of Scripture, but also dialoguing with people that might have scary 
scary different views from him, but always landing back on the authority of Scripture and Jesus. And he has this conference where he does that, and he talks about uh, race and sexuality and disability and power abuse in church, and how women have experienced sexual abuse from spiritual leaders in church, and deconstruction, and what is deconstruction, and how do we answer it, questions about it. Like, just allowing those conversations to take the forefront has, has been incredibly fruitful. Uh, in, in, in restoring young people's hope in the church and in the faith again. Um, that's what I'm seeing uh, a lot of as I travel, but a lot of uh, online ministry as well. Just is this, like Gary Brashear's question, is this church a place where honest doubt is not only welcome, but actually encouraged as a requirement for spiritual growth? Um, is this a place where honest doubt is welcomed as a requirement for spiritual growth? Because if deconstruction is about the cr- a crisis of faith, what is a crisis of faith other than bursting out of an, an immaturity into a more maturity? Uh, that's growth. That's just spiritual growth. It just has like this negative, uh, this, this negative brand now that people like to sell called deconstruction. Every, it's not new for people to have crisis of faith. It's like as old as the Psalms. And so, and, and, and so airing that, like the church is the place for crisis of faith. There's a psalm for that. There's like worship as crisis of faith. It's called Psalm 73. You know, uh, like surely God is good to Israel for such is a pure in heart. But as for me, my feet almost slipped when I saw how the wicked are prospering and the good people are failing. Where's God in all this? Surely God is good to Israel. But like, what about me? I've been pure. And look at those abusers winning. And by the way, that is a worship song in the Bible. It is a liturgy for doubt. And so I think that message has caused so many people in our church to come alive that, oh, God sees and knows. He's the God next to Hagar who sees the suffering of the abused. Um, So... That has generated a lot of, I think, conversion. My, my question is, yeah. goes to the categories you gave earlier around uh, fundamentalism and progressivism yeah. and the inter- revelation interpretation. So like yeah. many evangelical churches love the Bible, yeah. accept the revelation of the Bible, have very specific interpretations of yeah. it, but very much lack the application. Oh, okay. Of yeah. it. So what kind of recommendation, like after we binge on the Bible for a weekend or after we go to a, a series of worship events and we get our hit for worship, what does it look like yeah, Monday so, morning? That's so good. So we, uh, we kind of have what's called a rule of life at our church where we have eight inward, eight outward practices, like so what? Because um, I grew up, you know, in Calvary Chapel, it was Chuck Smith and his Bible and six nights a week, hippies just flocking to Bible studies. It was amazing. And it's what needed to happen after the sexual revolution of the 60s made everything topsy-turvy. And, and it was just this place of deep discipleship. Bible, Bible, Bible. It was a Bible binge, 100%. And at some point, like, I remember Chuck Smith's line. I, I, I can, his line, our goal at Calvary Chapel is to have the best fed, best loved sheep in the world. That was his title. That was his mantra. And, I'm, and growing up, the, the next generation was like, best fed, best loved. That's a really great recipe for obesity. <laughs> so, so if you don't move. So fed, loved, and then movement. What are you gonna, how are you going to practice the way of Jesus now? Uh, and obviously, he, God used him for a time, and every movement has a new vision statement or whatever. But, but, but the four inwards, silence and solitude, fasting, uh, scripture reading and Sabbath, uh, and then the four outward generosity, not just to your church, but as a way of life, tipping your waiter that knows you by name by now, tip them better than the other customers, and hospitality. How many people far from God come through your house every month? Practice that as the way of Jesus. So generosity, hospitality, and then vocation. How is your vocation an expression of the kingdom of God and not just a career? And then uh, community. Every week, we gather in community groups all over the city. We don't have a midweek gathering. We have Sunday and then community groups where people talk about, ask those questions, like, how are we doing this together? What, maybe there's a, a, a benevolence or charity initiative that our community group can own for the next year. 
And so we help our church resources, those community groups to do those things. My wife is in charge of the justice initiatives of our church where we go, okay, we're focusing around Generate Hope, which is houses for sex trafficking survivors in our city. How can we serve, resource them with toilet paper and mowing their lawns and painting their houses? And, and so actually having it as, as part of, this is what we do. We, we, we do these four inward and four outward from the Bible study. <laughs> like, so we actually have these mapped. And you have to be intentional, I think, about that.